connected. Even while you sleep among the campfires, the wings of my dove are sheathed with silver, its feathers with shining gold. The mountains of Bashan are majestic mountains. Rugged are the mountains of Bashan. The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. The Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the foundation and fountain of all being and all beauty. From you all is perfectly derived. Upon you is all most absolutely and perfectly dependent. From you and through you and to you is all being and all perfection. Your being and beauty is as it were the sum and comprehension of all existence and excellence. Much more than the sun is the fountain and summary comprehension of all light and dark and brightness of the day to you. O God, be all praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing if you are able. And our first hymn of worship this morning be Thy Mercy, My God. All right. And if you would, please turn to page 845 of, the, of your blue, same, well not same, but of your blue hymnals, and we'll be reading the Apostles' Creed. That's page 845 of your blue hymnal. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Now for the public confession of sins. Um, let us confess our sins together. Gracious Lord, we confess that we have dishonored you in our words, thoughts, and deeds. When we depend on our strength, we stumble. When we trust in our goodness, we become prideful. When we are confident in our plans for our lives, we fail to seek your will. We pray now, Lord, to forgive you for our many sins, to cleanse the darkness from our lives, and to turn our faces and our hearts towards you. We pray these things in the name of the most precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now for silent confession of sin. Now for the assurance of pardon and comfort. 1 John 1, 5 and 9. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're now going to move into a time of uh, our tithes and offerings. I will uh, pray and then we will pass the bucket. I believe we have an uh, offertory after that and then the uh, doxology. Our prayer today comes from the Valley of Vision. Let's pray. O oh God, thou fairest, greatest, first of all things, my, our hearts admire and adore and love thee. For our little vessels are as full as they can be, and we pour out all that is fullness before thee in ceaseless flow. When we think upon and converse with thee, 10,000 delightful thoughts spring up, 10,000 sources of pleasure are unsealed, 10,000 refreshing joys spread over our hearts, crowding into every moment of happiness. We bless thee for the soul that was created, for adorning it, sanctifying, though it is fixed in barren soil, for the bodies thou hast given us, for preserving its strength and vigor, for providing senses to enjoy delights, for the ease and freedom of our limbs, for hands, eyes, ears that do thy bidding, for thy royal bounty providing our daily support, for a full table and overflowing cup, for appetite, taste, sweetness, for social joys of relatives and friends, for the ability to serve others, for a heart that feels sorrows and necessities, for a mind to care for our fellows, for opportunities of spreading happiness around, for loved ones in the joys of heaven, and for our own expectation of seeing them clearly. We love you, Lord, above the powers of language to express, that thou art thy creatures. Increase our love, O God, through time and eternity. Amen.
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Would remain standing if you're able. Next hymn of worship is Abide with me. Thank you. Our word this morning comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Again, that's 1 John 1, 5 through 10. If you're in the uh, Red Bible, that's going to be on page 862, but I, I will be reading out of the uh, ESV this morning. But if you want to follow along in the NIV, it's on 862. <clears throat> this is a message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So the title of this sermon is God is Light, and, and we see that in verse 5 there at the top. Uh, now before I get into the meat of our text this morning, I do want to give some background on this. Okay, I, it's, it's, I think it's very important to look at the reason why John is writing this letter, or this, this epistle. Now, we do not know exactly who it was this letter is aimed towards as far as location and, and people groups, but we do know throughout the letter that they were believers who had heard the gospel at some point in time. And so uh, throughout the letter, uh, John uh, calls them brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we know that there are people that he deeply cared about and that he considered to be in fellowship when, with. And so the problem was at, at this time is that there was many false teachers, we can also call them heretics, who were spreading around a false gospel throughout various churches and were starting to uh, gain steam as far as winning people over to their distorted view of the gospel. And so John is writing to hammer down and to correct the message of the gospel, which again had already been given, but was becoming distorted. He cares again deeply for these people and their faith, and he's trying to steer them back into correct belief of the gospel. One of the themes also with uh, with uh, First John is the theme of assurance. Um, and so we'll see this. He's trying to assure these believers um, that they are still believers that we see throughout the, the, the letter. And then also he is writing, of course, to refute the false teachers and their twisted beliefs in defense of what is true. And so now to the text. Um, God is light. Well, this sentence and, and this phrase itself could be an entire sermon and probably even an entire sermon series on the attributes of God. And so I'll do my best to try to unpack this as best I can and work through uh, verses 5 through 10. And, and one thing I think we can notice uh, that's helpful is that John doesn't write in, in a, what we would call a linear progression of his arguments. He, he says one thing, jumps to another, and then reverts back to it throughout the verses. So, um, but I want to be faithful to the text, and this is just his style of writing in this, in this letter. And so, God is light. What, what do we mean by this? Well, we can look first as to what it doesn't mean, okay? And, uh, of course, we can look at the pagans and the gods that they worshipped uh, being the actual sun and moon and physical uh, resources and things like that. Uh, these, obviously, of course, being material and completely impersonal and false. And so... The sun and the moon and themselves, they worshipped as gods along with other natural resources. Now, this is not a, a knock to say that these uh, sun and moon are bad. You know, we use these all the time. In fact, um, Genesis 1-3, we can look at this, God creating the natural light of the physical world. If we fast forward a little bit into Exodus 13, we know that he uses the, the great pillar of fire to light his people's escape from Egypt throughout the night. And so, in fact, God's light illuminates and reveals to us not just physical light that we can use, uh, though we have occurrences of that throughout the Old Testament, but also, as we'll see, spiritual truths, distinctions, and a great hope for his people. On the relationship between God and light, the, the uh, uh, one biblical dictionary says this. He says that this link between God and light begins as early as Genesis 1, where God creates light to serve as a boundary to darkness. Your light is not only instantly linked to God's presence, but also institutes time and order over the chaos of formless void, functioning um, orderly environment for his people and the creation of the stars give humanity seasons and cycles of time by which to order their lives. The link of light with the creator also acts as a symbolic tie between light and life. If light symbolizes God's presence and God is the author of life, then surely where God is, life abounds, close quote. And so acknowledging that God's use of light to creation has very good and practical effects for us. But it goes so much deeper in that. Just a side note on this, we've seen the, the goodness of what these things bring to us uh, just throughout every day, but too often, and we still struggle, we still have this issue uh, in 2023, is that we take these good things and we idolize them. We make gods out of them, and we worship creation rather than, than creator. And so it's easy to see that not really as much has changed since John's time. I wanted to give a, a couple um, uh, scripture references to this, and, and there really are many. There's 
dozens and dozens and dozens I could have chosen from, but I picked a couple. Uh, one from uh, uh, Micah, since we are in the uh, Minor Prophets, uh, we will be taking a break from that for a while. But Micah uh, chapter 7, verse 8 says this. It says, Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. New Testament, John chapter 12, Christ is speaking. He says, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And so God is light reveals to us who he is, his very nature, and also ultimately points us to Christ, who is good and holy, just, righteous, and pure. One early scholar said this. He said that God is light, and that tells us not merely who he is in himself, but also how he is disposed towards us and how he acts upon us. Like a bright sunlight, his working and gift come to us and plant the truth in our own understanding. God's light is communicable, uh, communicable sorry, and guiding. It is spiritual and personal. And one commentary says that God's light even furnishes ethical direction. So again, uh, God's light is not merely just physical, but as we're seeing, it goes so much more deeper uh, than just that into how he relates to us. Segue into verses uh, 6 and 7. I'll read through those uh, again as we continue. Verse 6 says, If we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. And so here we have the verse, uh, sorry, uh, first of several of what we would call conditional sentences. And in the Greek, they like to use the word uh, subjunctive, but mainly just being conditional. So you see it's translated from Greek to English with the word if. So if, A, then, B. And we see this all throughout um, the text here. And so if light is always pointing towards God's character, which is good and pure, then walking in the light must mean that we are to be living in a manner that is pleasing to him, walking in accordance to what he has commanded of his people. And so the opposite of this would be walking in darkness. It would be living in a manner that is opposed to God's will and to what he has commanded. And so there are many people out there, and there were at this time, and there still are today, who claim to be followers of Christ, but the truth of the gospel really is not applied in their lives. Maybe behind closed doors when no one's around. Or maybe when they've switched from a Christian crowd to more of a secular crowd, you know, with older friends and things like that. So they may say with their words that they are in fellowship with God. But the truth is, as, as the text tells us, is that they are merely, merely deceiving themselves and God's truth is not in them. And in doing so, they are guilty of two things. Number one. They're lying about their relationship with God. And number two, they are not doing truth. What does that mean, though? What, what, what do you mean by doing truth? I think the best way to kind of define this is to say that, well, doing truth means...
there should be an effort to commune and to fellowship with the rest of the body of Christ. So regardless of our social preferences, insecurities, personalities, But, um, and nowadays, you know, with, with uh, professional sports, there's cameras everywhere, you know, so you, you really see everything. Uh, if you're on the sideline, you pick your nose. You're going to be on Sports Center that evening, you know. It's just, there's no hiding anything on those sidelines. Um, and during this game, these two players were just, emotions got high. They started uh, talking to each other, getting loud, yelling, uh, turning into pushing and shoving and whatnot, and it, it got pretty... Uh, electric there on the sidelines and people had to separate them and whatnot and I can't even remember if that team won the game or not but uh, at the end of the game you know you can imagine all the microphones pointing at you know those players like uh, any comments on what happened over there on the sideline and um, one of the players said something along the lines of this he said we're good we're good family fights but we're good and so I think we can have that same attitude uh, when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, so yeah, sometimes we disagree. Sometimes we rub each other wrong. We step on each other's toes sometimes. But family fights. We're still family. And so one commentator also, uh, to, to close on this point, um, he said this. He said that uh, this was Colin uh, Cruz in his commentary on First John. He said that there is no real relationship with God that is not expressed in fellowship with believers. And with that, we'll be moving on to verse 8. It says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in, in us. Now, we'd be foolish to think, as these people thought at this time, that even though we are believers, even though we are Christians, even though we know the gospel, we can recite it, we've read plenty of great books on this, um, that we could abstain from totally, completely from all sin. Now, it's important to remember that there's only one who has been able to do that, and we are not him. This is not to say that sinlessness isn't something that we should pursue and strive for. Indeed, every day, every night, every waking hour, that we should be killing sin. But these people were claiming that they were not actively sinning. And uh, one way I think we can put this uh, into context is that since they had come to know God, they were not actively sinning. Okay, the tense here and the verb used for uh, not sinning is, is in the present tense. So it's an active, ongoing uh, accomplishment, pretty much. But they are only deceiving themselves. And we can all think back. We can all think back at the time where we first were converted, where, where we first got saved, where God and, and Jesus became Lord and Savior of our lives. Think back to then. Mine was 2008. Done a lot of sinning since then. And so, realistically, this claim has no foundation and no um, realness to it. And there is no grounds for this. I mean, honestly, yeah, show of hands. I mean, who hasn't sinned since they got saved? I mean, it, it's, it's in our nature. Verse 9 says, though, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, if we are honest with ourselves about our nature, about the reality uh, of our present condition, it should lead us to repentance, and again and again, until glory. This is the great remedy we have for this mindset, for this position of lying to ourselves about who we are and where we stand before God. And it is to confess and to repent. Martin Luther, in his 95 Thesis, very first sentence, he says this. He says, Our Lord and Master, in saying, Repent ye, intended that the whole life of his believers on earth should be a constant penance, a constant life 
of repentance. To feel remorse and to repent and to turn away and to change from our sins. We mortify the flesh as he goes on to write later in his, his thesis. And so what happens internally has an external application in our very lives. And again, yes, it is the blood of Christ that will wash us again, clean again and again and again until glory. And he is faithful to do so. This is the recurring uh, theme. This is where the assurance comes into John's letters, that we can have assurance that though there is darkness that still remains in us, that we do sin sometimes, we do stumble, that our sins are forgiven and washed away by Christ's work on the cross. Lastly, in, in verse 10, it says this. It says that if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so we see kind of a repetition, like, well, hold on, didn't John just say this in verse 8? Now he's kind of going back to it in verse 10, what's going on? And so John is, we can see him pressing hard against this stance of saying, you who claim to have no sin, he's going to tear this down and set them straight. He's pressing hard against these false teachers. And the difference between uh, verse 8 and 10 is the tense in, in the Greek. And so uh, now, instead of a present tense, it is now a perfect tense. What does this mean? It's no longer talking about an ongoing achievement of not sinning uh, before, but now as a condition of not having sinned. They are saying, we have not sinned. And if that is their mindset, if that is their belief, then, then what need is there of any repentance? If they have not sinned, what's there to repent for? What is there to confess? There's no need of it. And so though at some point they knew the truths of Scripture and the truths of the condition of mankind, they allowed these outsiders and ideologies to take refuge in their hearts and minds, and therefore even denied what God had spoken on, on the very condition of mankind. And in doing so, they were making God out to be a liar. And how dare anyone claim that the God of the universe who rescued us from the depths of our sins is guilty of lying. We can look um, to the New Testament in Acts 5. You don't have to, ch to, to, to uh, go there, but in Acts 5, you see the story of Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife. And they lie about a certain amount of land and how much it was sold for and whatnot and are confronted on this lie. And if you know the story, the penalty for them lying is fatal. Both of them drop dead, basically, for their lie. They're caught red-handed, they're confronted, and they die, basically. That is the penalty for their lie. And it says also in Acts 5 that they're lying to man, but also they were lying to God. And so these, these the people at this time were getting it backwards. They were pointing to God and saying that he is the liar, that he was guilty of this very sin. And we see how... how um, how hard this sin is punished uh, in Acts 5, and now these people just have it completely twisted and backwards. When, um, when Shiloh and I first got married, she introduced me to a lot of uh, TV shows and books and authors and, and stuff like that. And, and um, one of them was uh, our favorite Belgian detective, Hercule Poirot. And... Uh, the David Suchet one, not like the, the new ones or the, the much older ones, but uh, David Suchet ones are definitely my favorite. Um, and one of his famous mysteries, uh, Murder on the Order and Express, and, and I'll try not to, I don't want to spoil the ending if you haven't seen it, um, but I'll try to give the gist of it and the point I'm making with this reference. Uh, so our de detective, he's on this train with a bunch of people, they're in the middle of just some snowy blizzard and whatnot, and one of the uh, guests is murdered in his cabin. And, um, and so Hercule gets to work, basically, he's trying to figure out how this happened, what are the clues, what are the, then he looks at the body language and everything, little comments that he hears amongst the, the other people and whatnot. And at the end of, the, of, the, of this, uh, this case, he's got it down. He knows what happens, and he keeps everything, he's really good at keeping everything to himself for the big reveal at the end, right? And his manner of doing so is uh, once he knows everything, uh, he sits everybody who's involved there and kind of just goes down the line saying, you, you're not guilty because this, this, and that. And he's got it down to the T. And um, without spoiling this, uh, this ending, he comes to the guilty party, uh, and there's more than one, uh, but one of these is a person who had a, uh, I, think, I, believe, I believe it was a Catholic background, 
and, and he's got them, right? They're, they're caught, they are the murderer, they committed this act, and their justification for this was they say that we were without sin. And so we did this. And of course, there's lots of uh, other details and stuff that I won't share here, but this is their justification for murdering this man in cold blood. And so my point I'm making is that there really is no telling what horrific things that we can do when we have convinced ourselves that we do not need God's forgiveness, that we have convinced ourselves that we are faultless and without sin. Now, verse 10 ends on a pretty very serious and grim note, yes. But the assurance, again, we're looking at assurance. This is the overarching theme of this text in this entire letter. We can rest assured, friends, that we serve a God who is faithful, as the text has told us. We can be honest with ourselves and our sin that we still struggle with, not having to pretend that it isn't there, but owning up to it, not having to romanticize it as is seen in some Christian circles but owning it and owning the fact that the blood of Christ is enough to wash it all away. Every sin that we have committed and will commit is paid in full by Christ's work on the cross. And God is faithful to finish that work in us. That is our blessed assurance, friends. Let's pray. Father God, you were light and in you there was no darkness at all. Because you are light, you are good and holy and pure and just. And though we are not those things, Lord, you still sent your Son to die on the cross for us, Lord, so that one day we may be with you, that we can have fellowship, communion with Christ and with the body of Christ, Lord. May you continue to carry us on all our days, Lord, as we persevere and we press to walk in the light. May your Holy Spirit guide And convict us, Lord, when we struggle and when we stumble. Being real with our sin, but being real with who you are as well, Lord. In these these things we pray in Jesus' name. Our final hymn of worship this morning is Jesus, I, My Cross Have Taken. If you would please find that insert, stand, and join me as we sing. Were that 
Let's receive God's blessing together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please uh, greet one another. Uh, uh, say hello to our guests. And I hope you guys have an excellent Sabbath, restful Sabbath. <laughs>